Hi. I'm Carolyn Jones with the Department of Social and Health Services, and th thank you for joining us for another workshop on the web. Tonight we're going to be talking about the Adoption and Safe Families Act and how that pertains to the dependency process of children being placed in out-of-home care. We are needing to talk about this because it's important for foster parents to know what their role can be and why decisions are made and when they're made uh, on behalf of our children. We are here in Kitsap County, Washington, which is a lovely hamlet just to the west of the city of Seattle and just to the east of the beautiful Olympic Mountains. It's a community of, of great diversity. There are a number of military installations here. It's known as a bedroom community to Seattle, but also has many rural pockets of poverty. And so there's a, there's a cross-section of issues that are dealt with in this community. Last year, there were 270 petitions for dependency filed in this particular jurisdiction. And so it's for that reason that we've chosen this small hamlet, this small county, because it really epitomizes how the Adoption and Safe Family Act can work to promote permanency for our children. And so without further ado, welcome to Kitsap County. All right, Superior Clerk for the State of Washington, in and for the County of Kitsap is on session, the Honorable Thurman W. Lawrence presiding. Good morning, please be seated. Regarding Jerome Wakefield, cause number 017-005432, Mr. Long, would you identify as present, please? I will, Your Honor. For the record, John Long with the Attorney General's Office representing the Department of Social and Health Services. Erica Hopper is the social worker that's here today, seated to my right. Julie Gaffney is the guardian ad litem present today. Ann Montgomery is present with the mother. Uh, the father is present as well, represented by uh, Larry Knapper. Are counsel ready for our hearing this morning? State's ready, Your Honor. Ms. Montgomery? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Knapper? Yes, Your Honor. Ms. Gaffney? Yes, Your Honor. Very well. Thank you. The Adoption and Safe Family Act was enacted by the United States Congress in 1997 in response to overwhelming concern that children had been languishing too long in foster care with a legal limbo hanging over their heads, that they needed to have a, be part of a permanent family. And so the Congress decided to create guidelines for the states to use to create more uniformity in the way we deal with child welfare issues. Now that is not to say that there aren't variations from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. What you here tonight discussed with this panel will be germane to Washington State and principally to Kitsap County. There are small variations from county to county within states as well. However, the spirit and intent of this law is embodied by the panel that I'm about to introduce. We have Commissioner Thurman Lowens with us this evening who sits on the, uh, the dependency calendar for Kitsap County, hears all of the, de de the dependency petitions and sees this through to um, where fact-finding can take place. And then we have John Long, who is the Assistant Attorney General, who represents the legal interests of the Department of Social and Health Services. We have Barbara Boffinger, who is a supervisor with the Division of Children and Family Services. She supervises the work that goes on in the court vis-a-vis -vis the department and its social workers. Deanna Bedell is a guardian ad litem, and uh, we'll ask her to kind of uh, broaden our understanding of what that role is uh, as we go on this evening. But principally, her role is to represent the interests of the child and no one else. We have Anne Montgomery, who is assigned counsel. In other words, she represents the interests of a parent. Should a parent not be able to afford an attorney, one is appointed for them. And we have Rick Williams with us this evening, president of the Kitsap County Foster Parent Association, a foster parent himself, and one that is caring for children who are significantly behaviorally disturbed. So 
Thank you very much, all of you, for joining us this evening. I want to point out to our audience that all of the forms that we make reference to tonight on uh, this broadcast are available on our website. You can download them. Also, if you would like to have a complete copy of the Adoption and Safe Families Act, which is also known as HR 867, you can get that by going to your search engine and just plugging in a the Adoption and Safe Family Act, and it will pop right up. You might want to take a look at it because this is really what drives um, our entire work with children. What we're going to do this evening is look at a uh, case scenario, and then we're going to look at the timelines that the Adoption and Safe Family Act apply to cases, and I'm going to ask each of the participants to kind of talk about their role in that timeline process. So without further ado, I'm going to just share with you a case that's completely <coughs> fictitious. It, it, it is absolutely not reflective of any real case, but just a composite of a number of cases. Tim is a five-year-old child of mixed race and a kindergarten student who presented at his school with numerous bruises on his arms, face, and neck. His explanation for the bruising is, I do not know. Tim is small for his age, several years behind developmentally, and does not make eye contact with others. He has an older half-sibling whom his mother gave to a friend in another state. Tim's school attendance has been sporadic, and a similar attendance history existed at Head Start in previous years. Stacy is a 24-year-old woman who has a history of methamphetamine use dating back six years. Methamphetamine, for those of you uh, who might be un unaware of it, is also known as crank, and it is a very cheaply manufactured stimulant that's uh, wreaking havoc in the drug culture today. Uh, Stacy is the mother of Tim, five, and Amanda, six. These children have different fathers. Stacy, um, a childhood victim of sexual abuse, has a long history of relationships with men who are physically and emotionally abusive. She works intermittently. She is currently living with a man with whom she expects a child in November. Stacy says that she is part Cherokee but does not have a great deal of information about her specific family tree. Stacy receives public assistance for Tim's support and for the unborn child she carries. She has started and aborted drug treatment no fewer than three times. Her drug of choice, methamphetamine. Her partner is suspected to support their use of methamphetamine by cooking or manufacture of the drug. Stacy does not have any appropriate family resource to help her or Tim at this time. Art is the live-in boyfriend of Stacy. He's Caucasian and 36. He has a long history of crimes uh, that point toward drug use and domestic violence. He's fathered children with at least three other women in the community and is not involved with any of them. He is not current on his child support payments for any of the children. Two of the women have orders of protection regarding Art. In other words, um, he has abused them and threatened them. He is said to uh, resent the presence of Tim in the household and is very controlling of Stacy's activities. Steve is the father of Tim. Steve is African-American and 24, discharged honorably from the service and now living in a different state. His parents live in that state and are supportive of Steve's responsibilities toward Tim. Steve is current with his child support payments to Washington State. Steve uh, was a very young man when he fathered Tim. He went out to sea shortly thereafter and found that Stacy quickly found another partner while he was underway. Steve is now attending community college in his hometown. So that's the case that we bring then to the, um, the point where there's an investigation. And I would like uh, Barb Boffinger of the department to talk about what her role or the, her subordinate role would be um, with this case. Basically, once a referral comes into the department, uh, a worker would be assigned to go out and investigate. They would make collateral contacts, interview the child or children, um, and assess the risk to the child at that time. They, if the risk is considered to be high, they may request that law enforcement come out and interview the child and, if appropriate, take the child into custody. If that was not the scenario, but the, the child was considered at risk. The department would um, consider filing a dependency action and file a dependency, dependency petition and request that the child be placed into foster care. Okay. And once that's done, where does the petition go once it leaves your desk or, or one of the other workers' desks? If the child, if the recommendation is that a dependency petition be filed, um, from the department, contact with the attorney generals will be made to staff the case and talk about it. 
and assess whether that would be appropriate course of action at okay. that time. And tell us what you'd be looking for in a petition. Well, we represent the uh, Department of Social and Health Services, so we, we uh, would review uh, the case. <coughs> Typically, uh, we discuss the case prior to a dependency petition actually being drafted. If it's, uh, if it's a case where the department is attempting to take a child out of the home without a law enforcement uh, uh, pickup, uh, but uh, we would uh, then review the petition as it's drafted. We'd look and see, uh, in this case, obviously, we'd have bruising uh, uh, that, that is concerning. We have uh, methamphetamine use. Uh, make sure that the allegations are sufficient uh, for at least how we feel that it would be for a uh, finding of dependency. Uh, court may not always agree with us, but uh, that's how we would view it at that point. Uh, we would then sign off on the petition. Uh, the social worker would uh, present that in court, and uh, at that point we would set a uh, shelter care hearing, which is the initial hearing that's held uh, within 72 hours of the child being uh, placed. Okay. And then Commissioner Lowens, it also reaches your desk before an actual pickup or shortly thereafter if the police are the folks that make the right. pickup? Right. If, if the department wishes to pick up, they apply for a pickup order of the court, which includes the original petition and then a motion affidavit as to why they need to place the child out of the care of the parents for the 72 hours. And assuming that that is sufficient and that order is signed by the court, then a shelter care hearing is scheduled for 72 hours out, uh, which is pretty quick. Um, at that shelter care hearing, the parents hopefully appear. Uh, and if they appear, then they are advised as to what they're there about, what their rights are, whether or not they wish to have counsel uh, to be retained by themselves, or if they can't afford counsel, counsel will be appointed for them. And we go through those issues. In Kitsap County, we bifurcate that process. In some jurisdictions, I understand they do everything the first hearing. In our jurisdiction, we give them their rights. We assign counsel if they wish counsel. And then I schedule the hearing for the next judicial day so that the parents can talk with their lawyers before they come back to court and make significant determinations and significant actions without their lawyers. I'd rather they have their lawyers. So mm -hmm. we come back another day and do the hearing. And you can talk to Ann about that in a minute. OK, great. And so Ann, when you are notified that you have a new client, what happens in your office? At our office, we're usually notified uh, the day before the next hearing, which is usually the second hearing that these folks have been to. Uh, we re usually receive the petition for dependency. We do not usually receive all the discovery, which is the case file, uh, until the day of the hearing. Um, in this particular county, we do not have an office of assigned counsel, uh, so each parent is appointed a lawyer from a different law firm around the county, and those parents uh, need to make contact with the different lawyers and see if they can talk to those lawyers prior to the hearing. In this particular case study, if I were to represent Stacy, who's the mother of the child, I may not see her until the day of the hearing. Um, Stacy presents as a young woman with a lot of difficulties in her life at this time. She may not have a telephone. She may not even have a mailing address. Uh, hopefully she would show up to court and we would have a very brief time, unfortunately the first day, to talk about her case and we could discuss what her legal options were on that first day. If I were to represent Steve, who is the father of Tim, and who seems from the face of it to be a pretty decent guy, uh, we would have the additional difficulty of having Steve be out of state. We may have an address for him. We may not have a telephone number. Even if we did, we may not be able to get a hold of Steve in time to talk to him before the first hearing. So there are some significant difficulties that come with this first hearing within 72 hours. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> And part of the department's responsibility when the decision is made to file the dependency petition is to establish reasonable efforts to locate a parent. And sometimes it may be somebody may live in another state, in this case Steve, or we may have an old address and not a current one. So we need to try to locate parents prior to the first shelter care hearing. Right. So then the workers are placing the children, and then looking for parents, making sure service is completed in terms of getting the petition to each parent so they know that this is going on. 
Correct. Um, arranging for visitation. Commissioner, talk about visitation. I know that that's an important thing in your courtroom. Um, talk to us about why that's important. Well, <clears throat> particularly with very young kids, but any kids for that matter. Uh, I've always said that kids out of uh, their home does harm, and I still think it does. The difficulty in our world is that having them out of the home is oftentimes better than the alternative, so as to keep them safe. But that doesn't mean that we sever all ties to the parents immediately on someone's affidavit or deposition or written uh, application. So that's one of the first inquiries is what type of contact can we provide for that interim between the first shelter care hearing when the parents first come in, get their rights, they're usually in shock, they don't know under, or understand what's going on particularly. And I want to make sure that there's arrangements made so they can check with their kids, their kids can check with them, and people can know that things are at least we're still on the same planet. And at the second shelter care hearing, which is the substantive shelter care hearing, where we actually conduct the hearing to determine whether or not there's sufficient basis to keep the kids out or not, then depending upon what happens there, the kid is either returned home, in which case we don't have a visitation problem, or if shelter care is directed, then we have to deal with those issues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think it's also important to note that at that, uh, that shelter care hearing, uh, in a case like, like we're dealing with here where you've got a drug abuse uh, allegation, if you've got a parent that comes in and, and wishes to get engaged in drug treatment uh, right away, uh, sometimes the shock of losing their children may be enough to, to maybe snap them mm -hmm. out of it. Now this person, I think uh, the mother here, has been in uh, three uh, aborted drug treatment programs, but uh, we've worked uh, in Kitsap <coughs> County to try to ensure that uh, drug treatment is available should they want to do that after consulting with their attorney, uh, and, uh, and we make that available right away and get that, uh, that set up right away. Right. That's an unusual aspect of the law because as you're working through the shelter care process to fact-finding, you haven't found the child as a dependent child. So your authority over the parents to tell the parents what they can and cannot do, particularly in engaging in services, in my opinion, is fairly limited. But if a parent acknowledges, yes, I have a drug or an alcohol problem, I want help, as Mr. Long has indicated, we've arranged with our local providers that we can get them in to see a provider within a day or two for their screening and then hopefully engage in service in a substantive manner fairly quickly, uh, even before fact-finding or anything else. So that if they want to get their child back, they can start the road down to recovery sooner rather than later. Mm -hmm. And so we have advocates for the parents, we have advocates for the child, and that would be the primary advocate, would be the guardian ad litem, who is assigned, am I correct, at the same time usually as assigned counsel. Yeah, at every, at every shelter care hearing, a guardian ad litem is appointed for every child in our county. And so talk to us about what that means to you. Um, well, the guardian ad litem is the one person in the courtroom that should be looking out for the best interests of the child. Sometimes the parents believe that we are their guardian ad litem and we try to make that very clear to them. Um, at the initial shelter care and usually at the further shelter care we likely have not been able to have contact with the child at that point but we will have talked to the social worker reviewed some of the case information um, we try to find out as quickly as possible where the child is placed we oftentimes have the ability to talk with the parents in a less adversarial situation outside the courtroom we may get relative information that the social worker may not have been able to get. Um, all of those things kind of add to looking down the road at possible placement resources. And we report to the court what we feel is in the best interest of the child at, at all points, but at that point we may address the visitation issue. Um, sometimes there are cases that come in, I, I'm not sure that this would be one of them, but looking at even returning the child home despite the dependency being filed and we may have an issue or opinion as to whether the child should go home at that point or not. And so when you visit the child, are, is it frequently in the home of the foster provider so that you and the foster provider are, are familiar with one another? We try to interview the child in the foster parent's home. Also an important aspect is the visitation and ob observation of the parents visiting mm -hmm. with the children. Um, we often get calls from foster parents uh, concerned about the children and what their current situation is. Um, so we do talk you find that them. helpful yes. to your 
And usually, I would say that the foster parents are more accessible to us than other professionals involved, mm -hmm. and I think they feel that way also, that the guardian ad litems are more <coughs> accessible. And, and Rick, from a perspective of the foster parent, how do you see your role interacting in terms of the guardian ad litem? Well, the guardian ad litem is really important to the child because the, the child's life is spinning out of control. They, they actually have no control in their life. Uh, the legal system has taken precedence over the parents' rights. Um, they're in limbo in the home. And the guardian ad litem is there. And, and the guardian ad litem comes into our home because the child is on familiar territory in a safe place. The guardian ad litem can interact with the child better and, and the ch in a relaxed atmosphere. So it's, it's a better atmosphere for that to happen. And the guardian ad litem plays an important role in, in representing and watching what goes on from an outsider's point of view and make sure that this child has everything done correctly and in the best interest of the child. Um, the judge can't always see that. You know, the attorney general can't always see that. The caseworker can't always see that. And sometimes even the foster parent can't always see everything as clearly as it needs to be seen. So the guardian ad litem is there for a very vital role. Mm -hmm. I think one of the pieces, uh, in, at least in this county, is that the guardian ad litem generally has the case the longest of anyone involved. The child may move from one foster home to another. They will more than likely be transferred between caseworkers just as the case moves through the system. But the guardian ad litem will be assigned at the initial shelter care and go through being the guardian ad litem for that particular child until permanency is achieved, either through dismissal of dependency or adoption or guardianship. I see. Talk to us a little bit about the CASA program as well and how that interfaces and adjuncts with the guardian ad litems? Um, well, in Kitsap County, the guardian ad litems, actually the juvenile, the Kitsap County Juvenile Department is appointed as the guardian ad litem. I know in other states, different agencies um, are, can be assigned as guardian ad litems, but in this county, the juvenile department is assigned. We have a very small, short, I mean, small paid staff. <laughs> well, I, well, short too, <laughs> <laughs> Only I'm the short one. Um, we have about five paid staff who carry cases of their own to represent as, as guardian ad litem for the children. But we also have, I believe, about 90 CASAs, and CASAs are court-appointed court special advocates. It's a volunteer program. We train um, people from the community to be the guardian ad litem assigned to a dependency case. Generally, the CASAs carry one or two cases and they carry those cases all the way through to permanency. Um, Just as the GALs do. Yes, and in fact they are appointed as, as the GAL. The, the benefit, I believe, of the CASA being assigned is that they can spend much more time on the case. They can get to know the child in a more personal way. Um, and they also represent the community at large and are not the professional involved. And sometimes that can add a great deal to looking at the best interests of a child in the community as a whole. Very good. That's a good point. Well, now we've moved on from the, uh, the initial shelter care to the response area. What takes place, Anne, in the response segment of, of the hearing process? Well, the response hearing is usually the third time that the parents have come to court. And this hearing, uh, which sometimes takes place at the initial shelter care hearing, sometimes not, uh, is where the parents, through their attorneys, have an opportunity to tell the court whether they are in agreement with the establishment of a dependency and they will engage in services, or whether they are opposed to a dependency that they don't wish the justice system, they don't wish DSHS to be involved in their family life. Um, in the case, in the latter case, uh, a trial is set, which is sometimes called a fact-finding hearing. The parents have a right to have that hearing held within 75 days of when that petition has been filed. Uh, a lot of folks think 75 days is quite a long time, uh, but I can tell you that for preparation of a case and for a trial, it is not a long time at all. Uh, in that 75 days, we are going through the case file we get from DSHS. We may interview people that the parents have given us names to um, 
contest some of the information that we've seen in the case file. We may even be back before the court to ask for funds for professional witnesses <coughs> such as psychiatrists, psychologists, or counselors. Mm -hmm. okay. If the parent comes in at the response hearing and indicates that they are willing to engage in the service plan and wish to agree to the dependency, then it jumps straight down to the dispositional hearing. And, and what is happening, Commissioner, at the dispositional hearing? Well, the dispositional hearing is the first time that the parents, uh, in a formal setting, hear what the department thinks are their de deficiencies and, and their needs and the services that are going to be afforded them so they have a plan to go forward and engage in a variety of services. Frequently, they're more than they can handle at one time. And I tell them that because we have a review uh, within 90 days after that dispositional hearing to see how they've gone. I tell them there's no way you're going to be able to complete everything on this uh, plan, but I expect you to be substantially engaged in everything there and making substantial progress. And the parents may well take issue with some of the uh, points or services raised by the department. Generally speaking, that's not the case because generally speaking in our county, uh, Anne may disagree, but I think generally speaking most of our dependencies go by way of agreement because the handwriting is on the wall because there's a significant drug alcohol problem in our community and that's hard to ignore when the, your, there's a urinalysis test that says you're positive for meth. I mean, that just, there's not much dispute about that. So the parents are presented with these facts and they're told that you need to go get an assessment, you need to go engage in these, this, uh, this uh, service, you need to engage in the parenting plan, you need to engage with the parenting classes or the counseling services or whatever. And they're set forth with that, they're asked if they agree or disagree. Ultimately, I decide what they're going to do, but that's the purpose of the hearing and usually uh, it's something that they tell me that they're anxious to get involved with. The proof is in the pudding as we go through the dependency. And prior to the, the dependency dispositional hearing, we do what's called a 30-day staffing, which is held about 30 days out from filing of the dependency petition. Parents are invited, guardian ad litems, foster <coughs> parents, um, parents, um, grandparents, uh, if they're in relative placement, they're oftentimes invited. The parents' attorneys are, are invited as well. And we sit down at a table and just kind of talk about this is what the department would be recommending to the court for services, and this is why. Are there other services that you think that you could benefit from in order to parent your children or child? Um, what are the needs of the child? And we get input from the, the foster parents at that point and the parents because there may be issues that we're not aware of mm -hmm. at that point in time. And the ideal situation is that Anne and the other defense attorneys would have a copy of that 30-day ISSP prior to the response hearing and have had a chance to go over that with their clients. Now the ISSP is the Individual Service and Safety Plan. That is one of the forms that is linked to the website this evening and we would encourage you to download that because as foster parents you are um, eligible to receive portions of that. <coughs> Uh, the portions that pertain specifically to the biological parents, th that would, of course, be confidential information, and that would not uh, be something you'd be privy to. But the rest of it, you certainly should have. And so the worker generally will notify you that this hearing is coming about or this 30-day uh, staffing plan and uh, planning meeting. And, and this form is something that you should be familiar with. So then now we're, we're at, this, at this juncture. John, from the AG's point of view, when you look over um, an ISSP, what are you looking for? What are some of the real salient issues that you want to make sure are addressed in there uh, from a legal standpoint? Well, you want to make sure that the uh, services are reflective of the facts. I mean, here, here we've got a case uh, where a child has some bruising. I don't know if we've been able to determine at this point um, what, was, uh, what was the cause of that. Was that the, the live-in boyfriend maybe that did that? Was it just neglect by the mother and the, and the child... Uh, uh, hurt himself uh, uh, in that manner. Uh, you want to make sure that, that the allegations that are listed in the, in the petition uh, and that are the concerns of the parents are going to be uh, reflected in the service plan for the parents. Um, I, th I think it's also important to note that uh, in a dependency the goal is reunification. Uh, that's by statute. I mean you get some real serious uh, fact patterns that come in that uh, never cease to amaze us, but 
um, the goal is reunification. You're trying to get these kids back with the parents, if at all possible. And to do that, you need to make sure that the services that are, are recommended by the department and, and sometimes... That's a reasonable effort. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Well, I also think it needs to be said at this point, however, that that's not always the way the parents see it. Mm -hmm. um, they see this as the state taking their children away. And very oftentimes, it's that adversarial relationship that permeates this process, and they simply do not understand why the state has done this. Um, a comment that's often made is, there are many worse situations out there. Why don't they go take care of those instead of harassing me? Um, the ISP that, that you just spoke about is, is also issued um, in a 30-day staffing at which point a trial may not have yet taken place. So it needs to be understood that if that service plan comes out prior to the trial, the parents may not be ordered to do any of those things. Uh, that sometimes creates uh, some complications where different parties expect these parents to be engaged in that process when there's really no requirement that they do that at that point. After a trial or after they agree to the establishment of dependency, then this ISSP would indeed be the basis of a court order and they would be required to perform those. Now, the reason we do it 30 days out is just in terms of time efficiency so that we're ready, we, that we have this information prepared? <clears throat> well, and I think that we're looking at this. These are the issues that we as a department see. And these, these are the issues that we are probably going to recommend to the court if dependency is found, mm -hmm. um, and I think it is stated at the 30-day the staffing that there is nothing in place that orders the parent to do any of these services. This is what we as the department see that could address some of the risk factors that led to the removal of the child. So I think that it's, it's a way to engage the parent in identifying some of the the needs that they have and their ch children have and the goal is to move it move it along excuse me Deanna <laughs> move it along as quickly as possible obviously so if yeah. you're getting the service plan out there as, as soon as possible it's like here's what we see as problems if they agree uh, with that that's great if they don't then they have the right to go to trial mm -hmm. but at least they know where they stand what right. what problems that uh, the department sees that they need to correct mm -hmm. One thing I would like to go back a little bit, in, in particular with this case, but oftentimes at the in, initial or even further shelter care hearing, we train our CASAs to look at permanency planning from that point on. Um, and I think the department has trained workers to look at permanency planning for children from the very first contact. And part of that, and one piece of that, the court addresses in asking the parents for any relatives who might be potential placement resources, um, not, not just for the long term, but also short term. Um, there's also um, the asking the parents if they have any Native American status, because those issues need to be resolved earlier than later, and if they're not addressed earlier, they need to continue to be um, looked at throughout the life of the dependency because any one of those factors can slow the case down in terms of permanency planning. Right. So I just wanted to go back to that. And in this particular case, for instance, with Tim, he does have a father in another state, and the CASA or the GAL, I'm sure the department has already done this, but we may be asking early on for an interstate compact to look at this father um, before we get too far down the road in the dependency. Mm -hmm. And would someone like to address what interstate compact is so that our foster parents know what we're talking about? The, the interstate compact is basically a process that there's a working agreement with this other states. If we have a parent, in this case Steve, who lives in, a, in another state, we have to complete what's called an interstate compact pa placement request. Once we have a court order that places the child into care, that process cannot be started until we have that. And the packet, it's a, a whole packet of information that gets sent off to headquarters in Olympia, who then sends it to the state headquarters where the parent resides, and then it gets sent out to the, the local office where um, they would do a home study of the parent. 
um, and assess whether it would be an appropriate place for a child to, to be placed. So would it be correct then in saying that one state may not place children in another state without that receiving state agreeing to and feeling comfortable with accepting the ongoing supervision of the case? Correct. That has Actually, to happen. Actually, it's a little bit more the other way around. This state would not be willing to place this child in another state until we had things hooked up in the other state, which implies their acceptance. Right. And, you know, there are 50 states in our union. And as you would expect with 50 states, there are 500 different reactions from different offices around the country. And in some areas, one caseworker will have far better response from a different jurisdiction than another caseworker. And I won't dwell on history, but there are 50 different states. <laughs> some work quicker than others. And it, and it is a long process. Yes. And um, sometimes it takes many months to get a response from another state. Mm -hmm. and, and you can see the problem in, in, a, in a dependency on Tim when you've got a father that's out of state that, as Ann said, is a, is a pretty good guy. Mm -hmm. uh, you're trying to get all this in place at the same time if Ann is representing that father, he, she may not want to agree to the dependency because we're alleging that there's no parent capable and maybe he would be capable had the geographic uh, mm -hmm. boundaries not, uh, mm -hmm. not been as they are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, is this an appropriate place to bring up alternative measures for Steve? Were he not, uh, you know, wanting to allow this dependency process? Actually, it, it really, the dependency process supersedes any kind of third party custody, correct? In other words, Steve couldn't go into Superior Court and say, I am this child's biological father, I would like to have a uh, a change in the parenting yeah. plan. Under the laws of the state of Washington, any other action concerning a child except a offender matter, a criminal matter, is state. You just can't go there. I have exclusive jurisdiction in the dependency and to the extent that someone wishes to pursue uh, legal custody, if you will, through a parenting plan or a guardianship or a third party custody or something else, they must come to the dependency court persuade the court that that's an appropriate thing to do. Not only is it appropriate, but it is appropriate at that time in the dependency, which generally speaking at shelter care, it's not because we don't even know what's going on yet. But maybe later on as we're moving towards permanence, that might be a more appropriate thing. Now, representing Steve, who's in this other state and for whom there are no allegations of abuse or neglect, uh, I may approach the court um, at the point of the response hearing uh, prior to trial or after trial and ask for something that, that we in this county call uh, concurrent jurisdiction, which would allow Steve to go to the family court uh, where either in this state or in his home state, and that, that may be different depending on his situation, and get a change of custody or to establish a parenting plan or a custody order. And if that did occur, at that time, uh, I would probably make my pitch to the Attorney General's office that this case should be dismissed. <laughs> and, and it very well might. I mean, if you've got a guy, uh, we've had fathers from out of state that'll, that'll show up in Kitsap County. They'll, they'll hear about this situation. They'll show up mm -hmm. and they'll demonstrate that they've got no problems. They'll demonstrate that they've got a, a support system there and relatives and and uh, it very well may be a, w uh, a way that uh, that the state can get out of this uh, family's life and, and put the child in a safe uh, safe situation. Mm -hmm. Now on the other hand, if I'm representing Stacy, this is a serious problem because once her child leaves the state of Washington, you can guess the chances of her having that child come back to the state of Washington, mm -hmm. especially given the issues that she's facing. Right, right. So would you then be leaning on her in terms of jumping through the treatment hoops and, and doing the things that well, you and, think and, she needs to do? And not only to jump through hoops, but to actually learn something and, 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 and make and some, make change. Make some yes. real change in her right. life, because right. that may be the only chance that she has of keeping this child with her. Right. Commissioner, if it doesn't, uh, if this is not something that can be agreed upon, uh, tell us what the what the court looks like in terms of uh, fact finding. Uh, who hears that? Is there is there a jury? Let folks know yeah. what what that's like. Well, first of all, the fact finding is formal, Perry Mason style for those old enough to remember Perry uh, <laughs> trial. I mean, the rules of evidence apply, procedures are there, and it is a formalized process. It is the only formalized process in the entire dependency process. 
The shelter care process, the rules of evidence do not apply. The reviews, the rules do not apply. The dispositional hearings, the rules do not apply. Uh, and it's basically up to the discretion of the court as to what information I think is relevant and germane and what I'll listen to and what I won't listen to. So it's, it's really a significant event. Uh, it is conducted in our county uh, by the judges. Uh, and it is conducted as a trial. We scheduled the trials. 75 days is the limit on when they can be conducted. And they are conducted at the courthouse in a courtroom. They are closed hearings because these are confidential matters. Uh, but they are conducted before a judge with the uh, bailiff, or, or not the bailiff, the court reporter and the court clerk there. There is not a jury. It is exclusively a judicial determination as to the best interests of the child and whether or not a dependency should be established. And that's the focus of the fact-finding. The focus really shifts over to the parents and whether or not the state is able to prove that the parents have either done the abuse or the neglect or they're not able to provide for the care and safety of this child. They have to prove that uh, by what's called a preponderance of the evidence, which is more likely than not 51%. Uh, and that's the st standard of persuasion that the state has. In other hearings, when it comes on for hearing, for instance, if they wanted to do a, a termination of parent-child relationship as part of the permanent plan for the child, that's also a formal trial. The rules of evidence apply and so on. But the standard of persuasion there, because it is a more significant act that is being sought, the standard there is by clear, cogent, convincing evidence, which on a scale of things you start off with preponderance which is the normal civil standard that's what fact-finding is you move to clear cogent convincing which is more than a preponderance but not quite what a criminal standard is which is the beyond reasonable doubt so it's a it's a major event and it causes mr long and miss montgomery to jump through all the legal hoops <laughs> correct well, on any in child welfare cases the standards of proof are higher. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's clear, cogent, and convincing. Uh, right. beyond, beyond a reasonable, reasonable doubt, doubt for, for termination? termination. Okay. But in terms of fact finding for the dependency, would that be what would the mm -hmm. standard of clear, thing? cogent, convincing, and convincing. on, right. on okay. the fact finding? Thank you. So it's still higher. Okay. And so then uh, let's just take a look then at where we are in this process. We've now moved beyond the fact finding. Uh, say we may have uh, had an agreed dependency and the case moves on from CPS Child Protective Services in this state to a more long-term case manager with Child Welfare Services, correct? Right. And uh, then what happens from there? Typically cases are moving from Child Protective Services who do the initial investigation to ongoing Child Welfare Services at about the 45 day. Um, anywhere from 30 day staffing on to when the dispositional happens. Um, the role of the CWS worker is to work towards permits, permanency for kids, whether that be the return home, um, adoption, third party custody, guardianship, um, whatever the permanent plan is identified as. And the department is is really working at return home of the child if that is possible but at the same time they're doing concurrent planning so that there's a there's a backup plan if you know something happens that a child can't go home what is the plan going to be is mm -hmm. it going to be a adoption so there oftentimes is, is two plans going at the same time right. um, and so typically the case will will stay in CWS child welfare services until the permanent plan is achieved whether it's dependency dismissal um, a child becomes legally free or a guardianship is established and this is a very difficult piece, I know, for foster parents because particularly those who come into our system with the idea of adopting, foster adopt, this concurrent planning that we do, which we have to do, I've heard it, I've heard it described by somebody from Children's Home Society as legalized schizophrenia because you've got these two plans going at one time. We ask the foster parents to open their hearts and homes love these children as their own or almost as their own and then there's this roller coaster while we work to return that child to the bio family talk to me as the president of your foster parent association it's a very active one what are the kinds of things that you hear from folks in that role well it's clearly frustrating for a, a, a foster adopt parent 
who is, is primarily in foster care to adopt a child for whatever reason. Um, and they find, you know, they wait for the day when that child is legally free so that they can actually start the adoption process. But getting to that process sometimes, um, all these players here affect the parents and the parents affect the players. And that child is the ping pong ball that goes back and forth. So. Uh, Unfortunately, the foster parents are in limbo, and the child's life is in limbo, trying to figure out when the parent is going to come on board and get their act together, do the things that are required of them if they ever want to get that child back. Um, and sometimes it happens, and oftentimes it doesn't. But the process can be really frustrating for the foster parent who wants to adopt that child. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, that foster parent has become uh, thoroughly involved with the child. The child has become, especially when they're really young, sometimes they're, they're taken from their parents when they're just a week or two old. And that foster parent nurtures them and raises them and their mommy and daddy. And then sometimes, um, way too long down the road, that child is taken away from them. And now they have a new mommy and daddy that doesn't have a clue what those kids are about. And they have to start all over and the kids are, actually I think they're severely affected by it. Mm -hmm. So the faster it happens, the better, mm -hmm. one way or another. Mm -hmm. um, the, the adoption process is clearly not gonna ever be perfect. There is no process that's perfect. Mm -hmm. Foster parents, uh, above all other people, and I don't mean to sound like anybody sitting here um, is callous, but foster parents more than anybody live with these kids day and night, and they they uh, have them cry and tell their fears and their and their sorrows, and they watch their behaviors, and it doesn't matter how badly a parent has <coughs> abused a child, neglected the child, uh, or mistreated it. That child always loves their parents and always has a dream of going back home, even if it means it's going to kill them, because that is the connection that you cannot ever break. And the courts have a difficult job of taking that child and putting them where they're safe and when they can nurture and survive. And that's what foster parents do. And sometimes we get our hearts broken too. We don't get to keep the kids. Mm -hmm. Or sometimes they move on or sometimes they don't thrive in the situations because of what's been done to them. What role do you see, Commissioner, the foster parent playing in terms of apprising, apprising the court of what's really going on with the child? Um, how do you like to um, have interaction with the foster parent? Is it in written form, coming to the hearings? What types of things do you look for? Well, first of all, people need to understand that I'm seeing the case in that particular Monday or Wednesday morning on the calendar. I have the ISSP and I have whatever the lawyers have given me. I have whatever Ms. Bedell might have or the cost of this there. And basically that isn't much in the greater scheme of things. And I'm there to review what's happened in the preceding six months, three months, or whatever my review cycle has been. And sometimes I'll have more frequent review cycles. The foster parent, in my judgment, plays a very key role in that process. And they are always welcome in my court. They have a right to have input to the court. And that comes in a variety of forms. The forms that I don't take, I don't take a phone call and I don't take emails from them because that's ex parte communication and I can't deal with that ethically. But I do take letters which I then make copies of and distribute to all the parties. They can come to court and I will ask them if they're in court if there's anything they'd like me to know about it and then they're free to tell me anything they want, uh, subject to the same parameters I impose upon everybody else, that is relevancy and, and being germane to the issues. But the foster parents are a very key word to be heard as to what's going on with a child. And in fact, I can think of some cases where there was a suggestion that a child leave the state of Washington and go elsewhere uh, and the foster parent was very persuasive that that should not happen at least in the parameters time-wise that were being suggested uh, because of the impact on the kid and so we didn't so I think they're very very essential to the process and I've been before you and had you uh, show a keen interest and ask me you know do I have anything to say on behalf of the child or the case and uh, and it's really important that uh, any judge can can hear what the foster parent has seen when that child turns up at your doorstep and we take teenage boys so when I call them children they're they're not really children but when they come to you filthy dirty they have lice in their hair they don't have any clothes that are worth keeping they haven't had a bath they haven't had their toenails clipped their fingernails clipped they need a haircut um, they're malnourished 
um, and they still love their parents. Make no, no means about it. They've learned how to roll drunks in parks and steal food from grocery stores. Um, they've learned some outlandish behaviors, and when you hug them, they cry and they scream and they run away. But if you chew them out and you, you get in their face, they take it stoically like a soldier. You, 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 you got to be able to take that to the judge and say, these parents have damaged this child so badly. And a, and a foster parent is not the, the best friend of a bio parent because we're the recipients of what they have, have bred. And, and so sometimes we're not very understanding and we really don't care what their excuses are. All we care about is that kid and trying to salvage him so that he becomes a, a productive, uh, decent human being in our societies because we're surrounded with a lot of people that tear up kids and spit them out over and over again and we've got to figure out how to try to make them whole again. And, and that's really the, the real dilemma, isn't it, in terms of the concurrent planning that, you know, we in the department see you as our right hand. I mean, we can't do what we do without you. And so, you know, we hear your frustration because mm -hmm. you see that child come back from visitation being upset or you saw that child come to you as you just described in such a, a disarray. And yet we ask you, in some cases, we're training foster parents to actually interface with biological parents and, and work therapeutically with them. And we do do that. And, and you do that. And, and I think that, you know, we have to really give kudos to you as a group of people because I think we ask an awful lot of you. I've got to truthfully say that most of the time, and, and this is really sad, but most of the time we don't see the successes that we'd like, or at least to the degree we'd like. But I, I, I have a... a one success that that's really standing out right now was a, a, a methamphetamine user. You know, we call it Crystal. Uh, pretty hardcore. Um, falling down on her luck, lost her kid. And uh, CPS took the child, put it in foster care. Mom has done everything that the court has said. And mom is doing great. Mom is clean and sober for quite some time now. She's doing everything. And we actually see the day that her child is going to go home. And this kid hasn't been terribly abused which is a real thankful thing it's, it's going to make a beautiful family one day it's one of those rare times when you actually feel good about what you're mm -hmm. doing and that you know you're making a difference yeah that's wonderful to hear because we know that doesn't happen often. it doesn't enough. happen a lot uh, not not very often could John would you please describe the difference between guardianship and adoption uh, and what would be the scenario that the department would support guardianship versus uh, adoption. Well, I'll, I'll defer to Barb on the, on the scenario where they'd, they'd uh, approve it because that's, that's a social work decision. We try to stay out of the social work decision, but there's two types of guardianships. There's, there's a regular, uh, what is it, Title 11, Title 11 guardianship, was, which is outside the dependency forum. And then we have the dependency guardianship, which is done uh, pursuant to the dependency statutes. Uh, and at least in Kitsap County, there's no uh, periodic reviews required, but in Kitsap County, we review them on a, on a yearly basis just to make sure that everything is, is going, uh, going as planned. Um, I think the key uh, with a guardianship is that the guardianship can be vacated. <coughs> it's it's uh, designated as a permanent plan, but, but it's not as permanent as adoption. Uh, the child remains a dependent of the court. Right. The court is still responsible uh, for that child, and uh, if, if uh, a parent is still a parent, obviously, and if they want to bring it back uh, before the court and, and try to get that modified, try to get more visitation, try to vacate that guardianship, then uh, that's something that the court uh, will have to consider, whereas in an adoption, once there's a termination, or excuse me, in a, in a termination, once the parent's rights are terminated, uh, they're done. Right. The guardianship, in other words, can be a form of permanency Correct. for the child that not, does not necessitate termination of parental rights. Right. And there are some cases where that would be okay. Maybe Barb reasonable. can elaborate on that. <laughs> and a lot of the cases involve adolescents where they don't want to be adopted. They're mm -hmm. refusing to be adopted. Um, they're older. Um, oftentimes, they're multi-problems. Um, high needs kids where a family is committed to providing for them but they're not willing to to do the the step of adoption um, or there's a relationship with the biological parents that continuing that relationship under the the format of a guardianship is appropriate um, 
we have some kids that have severe disabilities that a guardianship may be more appropriate because of the intensive services that they can get. Um, but it's typically with those populations, not as much with the younger kids. Yes. So the last part of the timeline is, is termination. Let's talk briefly about that. Then we have some questions that foster parents have submitted that uh, we'd like to get to before the end of this broadcast. Termination. In, in terms, I think in terms of our case study here, yes. um, let's, let's assume that maybe we're a year down the line from when we first started and Stacy has not done her alcohol and drug rehab program and perhaps she is still living with uh, Arthur here who seems to be one of her bigger problems uh, and maybe she has not engaged in the service plan and that would be the point where we would be at a permanency planning hearing and the the state would argue that the permanent plan should not be return home and it should be termination of parental rights and mm -hmm. adoption and if the court orders that uh, I would be informing Stacy that she may be receiving a petition to terminate her parental rights either by personal service or by a certified mailing and that initiates a whole new court case mm -hmm. it with another response date and another trial date which from beginning to end we may be looking at another nine months until we come to a resolution whether the child ends up going home sometimes a termination is a wake-up call for a parent that they need to really look at what they're doing um, and sometimes they get it together and they get the child home prior to the termination trial but that's not always the case and and really that's another reason why uh, the adoption and safe family act was enacted by congress was that we have second and third generation folk now who grew up with the state you know kind of being in their family's business and um, many of them become rather cavalier about that. Well, you know, we'll just kind of clean up the yard and they'll go away again. And, and I found when I was doing the CPS work that it was really, you, you really had to educate them that things had changed, that there were timelines now that, you know, you didn't have forever to get this fixed and that you could terminate. Uh, and that was kind of a wake-up call for them. Well, it is. There, there are some families that maybe came into the system in the early 90s when I started doing this, um, who the case could languish. Mm -hmm. And they had maybe three or four years to get their things together and to get these children to come home. If there's another child born into that same family with those same issues today in 2002, they're very surprised to hear that there are some very specific timelines and there's just not that time mm -hmm. to get these things done that they had before. Right. And I, I personally think that it's a good thing that we have this timeline now because, like you said, some of those kids are languishing in foster care for incredible amounts of time. Uh, their, their sense of identity is gone <coughs> and, and their who they belong to and, yeah. and what they're about is totally destroyed because they're in foster care for three or four years. Mm -hmm. well, one, um, thing, one thing that I like, I like to hear from the foster parents, as I say, but I also like either the foster parents or the CASAs or guardian of items to bring pictures of the kids. Mm -hmm. Because with a picture of the child there, it refocuses everyone in the hearing that this is what we're talking about. And the parents can talk all they like about, well, it's only been 15, 18 months and so forth. Well, the child's only two years old, which means that the vast majority of that child's life, the child has been in foster care. And that's not appropriate. We need to move forward. And we do time life books for all of our kids. Mm -hmm. They have pictures from the day they arrived, how much they weighed, what you know, everything about them, mm -hmm. so that when they leave, hopefully they're going to go back to their parents, and they'll be able to say, "This is what you've missed," you know, and this mm -hmm. is what I was about. So uh, very important. And I think it's yes. really important too to to not sound so gloomy. You know, an awful lot of kids do be go back home within 90 days mm -hmm. of being, you know, in service. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the parents just need a little extra help. Things have fallen on bad times and uh, and the state jumps in there and, and shows them how to get their act back together, gives them services and the kids are back home and everything's fine. So mm -hmm. it's it's not all gloom and doom. It, mm -hmm. Some of us foster parents, the type of kids that we take, uh, it seems that way sometimes. Well, it's difficult work. That if kids are going to go home, the likelihood statistically that they'll go home mm -hmm. is going to happen in the first 90 days. And after that, it drops off significantly. Mm -hmm. um, you have a child in care for a year, the likelihood of return home is pretty minimal. So the quicker 
for everyone, the better. And I think that's why the concurrent planning is so important, is, you know, while you're working to try to return the child home, there's a backup plan in case something happens, in case Stacy doesn't get into the services, um, in case she gets into the services and, and relapse. Um, and so there's, there's another plan there. So at 12 months, if the, a parent is not in compliance and not making progress, and it's our permanency planning hearing, the, the recommendation in all likelihood will be adoption as a permanent plan. But we continue to provide services to the parents in hopes that we can return the child home if that can happen. Okay. The difficult, sorry, yeah, yeah. <laughs> go ahead this time. You should sit next to well, each thank other. thank you. <laughs> um, actually, now you made me forget <laughs> what I was going to say. Well, the, the difficult cases, what I was going to say, is the difficult cases are the cases where the, the, the parent is marginal, marginally engaged in services. Mm -hmm. They get into drug treatment, they do pretty well for a while, and then they fall out. We file a termination petition, and they're engaged in services uh, to a sufficient degree. Maybe we have to continue the trial date to make sure, because we have a burden to meet on those cases. And uh, if we can't, can't meet the, the burden uh, of what we're required to prove at a termination case, then, then we're unable to go forward. So uh, those are the cases, I think, that are difficult that, that take a long time. And that, those are probably the kind of cases that are extremely frustrating for foster parents that are, that are hoping to have some permanence for the child. And I, and I think a lot of times when that is the case, and I've seen that actual case happen more than once, the child does go back home because the parents have met just enough of their responsibilities and then down the road you may visit juvenile hall and find their kid in juvenile hall because he's been acting up getting in trouble lack of supervision and you you tell yourself all along you know this should not have happened but it has to happen that way because we have to follow the rules right well and i think the key is we cannot create perfect parents mm -hmm. and we need to create safe fam safe families for kids to go to and if that can happen to the to their birth parent, then that's where kids should be. Um, but they're not going to be perfect. You know, one of the things that I think has really strength, strengthened the whole process is in the last five years, foster parents have become uh, a larger part of the team uh, mm -hmm. with a greater amount of respect. And I think that's fostered a, using that word, uh, a greater relationship, better working relationship with uh, caseworkers especially mm -hmm. and the courts that a better understanding the education process has really made it a lot better too but I, th I don't think things have ever been better for a foster parent foster kids or the department as a whole than it has been in this last five years that's very true there are five competencies now in our pre-service curriculum mm -hmm. and, the, and they are to keep kids safe to be on top of their developmental needs to be part of a professional child welfare team is is right up there as mm -hmm. well and um, that's where the education comes in. That's why we're here tonight, to encourage foster parents to be part of this dependency process. We really should talk about uh, diversity a little bit. What, as a court system, do we do here to ensure that people with English as a second language or who might have developmental disability issues, um, cultural differences, how do we address those? Um, how, does, how does the bench educate itself in terms of that, Commissioner? Well, education-wise, the, the Superior Court Association for our state has conferences twice a year, which generally has some aspects addressed to dependencies and some diversity considerations and cultural considerations. And then the uh, Department of Social and Health Services runs the Children's Justice Conference now for about eight years now going, I think, and that's an extraordinary uh, three days in Seattle where they bring together a compilation of experts from around the country which are nationally known speakers to talk on a variety of topics and that's very helpful and then locally we do the best we can we've had some some judges from the indian tribes who have come in and and explained to us ICWAC and some other considerations that provide insight that we otherwise would be lacking because uh, particularly with the indian culture in our community and the number of different uh, tribes that are around it becomes a problem sometimes because we don't have uh, that great an expertise in the area so we have to find it where we can. True and we didn't talk a lot about ICW in the Indian Child Welfare Act but it really does um, dictate where children are placed or uh, who has jurisdiction 
We didn't talk about the multi, Multi-Ethnic Placement Act, which says that we are not to use race other than with regard to Native children. We are not to use race as a sole predictor or sole selector of a placement. And that was a question that foster parents had um, brought in uh, or, or phoned in, was um, can only African American or Latino <coughs> foster parents care for children of those particular cultures? The answer is no. There's no restriction. In fact, we may not use that as a sole indicator of placement. Uh, there was another question here about what does uh, what what is a federally recognized tribe? Well, I did some research on that for you. Uh, and there's not really an answer, but there's a list. <laughs> the Bureau of Indian Affairs generates a federal list, and if the tribe is listed on the list, they are a federally recognized Indian tribe. If they're not, they're not. Uh, and the decision of what's on the list and what's not, quite frankly, is political. Okay, well, that's a good answer. And I think the commissioner has done a really good job on asking parents at the shelter care hearings if there is Native American ancestry because the department is obligated to research that and identify Native kids and, uh, and ensure that their needs are met, whether it's placement in um, <coughs> an, an identified Native home and involve the identified tribes and the local Indian Child Welfare Council on that. And mm -hmm. that's, a, that's an issue that really slows down uh, uh, mm -hmm. how quickly these cases yeah. can move around. And actually the department does exhaustive work whenever there's a question sure. of, of mm -hmm. uh, a child's background. You, um, <coughs> foster parents have known and, and watched the process proceed. It mm -hmm. takes a long time mm -hmm. it, because you are so thorough in making sure that these kids are placed properly. Well, the Indian culture, from my experience, uh, is there's a significant break for permanency in terms of what a child should have when the child cannot go back to their parents. The Anglo-Saxon approach is let's go forward with termination, adoption, guardianship, what have you, depending upon other factors. The Indian culture says no. The Indian culture says this child is a child of the tribe. Mm -hmm. And whether or not the biological parents can have the children back doesn't eliminate the biological aunts and uncles, but more importantly, the emotional aunts and uncles of the tribe, which have raised the other children of the tribe, including this child, or could. And so we'll frequently come up close to a, a termination trial, and the tribe will step in and say, excuse us, but the child is now coming with us. And under the law, in certain, certain circumstances, uh, that can happen. They have a trump card there, effectively. And that's, that's not wrong or right. It's just it is. And uh, we have to be sensitive to those things. One more factor about about that kind of situation is that sometimes <coughs> the parents agree that the tribe should step in mm -hmm. um, and and uh, take take some responsibility towards this child. But what slows down the process even more than that is when the parents disagree that the tribe should step in mm -hmm. and take the child. Mm -hmm. That in generates several more court hearings, sometimes more than several, as we've <laughs> had in the past. <laughs> Um, and and I, I think one case in particular, <coughs> maybe an extra year or so, um, deciding that issue. But that that's indeed is a huge uh, factor as to, as to how long that process will take. And just one more comment on ICWAC, and then we'll move to something else. But the law is very clear. The decision <coughs> on whether or not a child is a member of the tribe is not my decision. It's not the state of Washington's decision. It is the decision of the tribe, mm -hmm. exclusively and binding upon everybody else. And that varies from tribe to tribe, sure it does. whether yeah. it's maternal or right. paternal line, percentages, mm -hmm. and so forth. So mm -hmm. check with your local tribe, I guess, is really what you have to do there. But mm -hmm. you're not just dealing with your local right. tribe. No, that's we true. We oftentimes are dealing with tribes in many other states, mm -hmm. which then mm -hmm. gets the interstate compact right. also involved. Oh, no, that's true. And that the also. Alaskan tribes as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, Anne, as a is assigned counsel, here's a question that I, I would be interested in having you consider. How can we plan for permanency for children when biological parents may temporarily clean up a drug problem but then uh, and get their children back and then relapse? Um, with multiple relapses, how, how do we provide permanency for these kids while still protecting parental rights? Well, as a defense attorney, my primary responsibility here is to advocate on behalf of the parents. <coughs> and these parents have a right to have that time 
to, as you said, clean up their act mm -hmm. and to do these services and show progress. I think society has recognized over the past few years that especially drug abuse is a rather insidious mm -hmm. disease at times and relapse is actually a part of that. Mm -hmm. um, so one relapse, two relapse, it, it really is unclear as to when when is enough enough? When is it a lost cause? When is it yeah. a lost cause? Because I will keep fighting for that person to have another chance because you never know if that's the opportunity that they take to lead a clean and sober lifestyle. But I think that's the very issue where um, the Adoption and Safe Families Act conflicts with the parents and their need for services because the time frames with ASFA are so much shorter mm -hmm. than what mm -hmm. many parents need um, in order to clean up. Mm -hmm. um, well, and the resources available for drug treatment beyond 28 days, I mean, you know, that's just scratching the surface mm -hmm. and keeping mothers and babies together and treatment. And mm -hmm. A lot of folks wonder why trials get continued. And, you know, those defense lawyers keep asking for those trials to be continued. I'm asking that question now. <laughs> he asked that this morning. Yes, he did. Do you always believe that you're doing the right thing when you're defending some of these you know, people? No, that does not enter into it. Doesn't I, matter. I have a job to do, and these people need a legal assistance in, in getting their position put out there before the court. So you can't be emotional she about it. sleep at night. No. <laughs> no. 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 You know, and depending on, you know, my position is going to be very different on whether I'm representing Stacy here or Steve. And clearly different. Very clearly different. And you have to be able to represent the interests of these two people and get that out there before the court uh, with, without getting personally involved. Um, because I think that does color some of your legal representation. You know, on a professional basis, the lawyers representing parents have the easiest job because they clearly know what they're supposed to do. The lawyers representing kids have a difficult job because they're torn between what's the kid saying and what's best interest in the guardian ad litem. Foster parents have a hellacious job because they're expected to do everything and do it right and then lose it. And the, the state and the department has a horrendous job because they're supposed to be balancing these things, which is my job also, balance between the needs for security and safety for the child and the need to give the parent servants, uh, services to the parents to get them clean and sober, whatever the problem is, and when is enough enough. And it's, uh, it's mm -hmm. an interesting process. And you get to make that call sometimes. Sometimes, which is enough. why I have coal black hair. <laughs> <laughs> and as a social worker and as, you know, listening to social workers, having to go into the court <coughs> and recommend that these parents should not have any rights to their children any longer is very difficult. Mm -hmm. It's not a decision that social workers take very lightly and sometimes you have to push them through various staffings within the department to make that decision. This is a parent that they have developed a relationship with over a year, sometimes two years, and it doesn't mean that they don't love their child, it just means that they should not have the, the parenting of that child. To get back to your question a little bit, I, I think there was something very interesting that was brought to our, our, all of our attention at a meeting um, from an alcohol and drug treatment provider who said some of these people who are in draw, involved with substance abuse, imagine yourself if you've ever endured a, a surgery or a medical procedure and you've had those painkillers. Um, Imagine that foggy feeling that you have, and that's what these folks mm -hmm. deal with every day. Not being able to process the information. No. If you have a list, you get your ISSP, and you mm -hmm. have a list of eight things you to have do. to go do, right. and you've got telephone numbers and places to go. You may not have a driver's license. Mm -hmm. You may not have a permanent place to live, so you don't know how to get here. And if you have that foggy that feeling, haze, right. that haze, uh, this becomes really, really difficult. Mm -hmm. and, and, and underlying depression as well. The, the good side of what we do um, is exemplified in something that will take place in this county or in this region tomorrow, and that is a graduation ceremony for 52 young men and women who are aging out of care with their high school diplomas, thanks in no small part to our foster parents. And so tomorrow, you will be the keynote uh, speaker at this thing. And uh, we have a, uh, a question here that I think it would be a nice way to end our evening together. 
What can the court do to encourage adolescent foster children who have given up on becoming successful and independent? What, what does the court uh, do or can do to uh, give kids hope that they can uh, move beyond and, and achieve in spite of all that's happened? Hmm. Come <laughs> listen to my talk tomorrow. No. Uh, when kids come to court, I try desperately to connect with them in some manner. Because, as I say, they're there in an isolated frame of time. They don't understand what's going on. And here's this gray-haired man in a robe up there, and everybody's being deferential. What's this all about? So I try to connect with them, and I try to find something they're interested in. We'll talk sports, or we'll talk some interests, or we'll talk school. I want to see their report cards. I'll give them encouragement where I can. I'll kick them in the butt where I can. Uh, but the idea is to try to, I think, to get a little personal with them, to give them some immediate goal that is achievable, and then build on that. And the foster parents are very helpful on, on doing those types of things on a regular basis. Uh, when the kids come in and see me, usually it's because they're in trouble. And sometimes we're successful, and sometimes they keep coming back. And so foster parents, you know, in a letter to the court, can say, you know, I have concerns <coughs> that Johnny is doing X, Y, and Z that's not in his best interest, would you mind having a little chat with him? Not a problem. The commissioner told one of my kids he has a motorbike. That, yeah, you can bring it to your foster parent's house, but you can't ride it till you get a B average. There you go. He hasn't got his B average yet. He hasn't ridden his motorbike either, but at least the commissioner was trying. Mm -hmm. That's the best we can do. Mm -hmm. So I think to sum all of this up, it does take a village. This is all part of the village. Mm -hmm. And in, in many ways, we're all parenting these children together uh, and and maybe if we all work hard enough and, and work toward the same goal we can be successful in parenting these we kids. are all working very hard and together every day you betcha right. we want to thank you for joining us this evening it's been a real pleasure to be in the midst of these folks who spend so much time and energy and have so much talent and work for the benefit of the children of this community if you have comments feel free to email us uh, at the email address at the bottom of the web page uh, we are happy to hear from you and, and want to know what kinds of subjects you want to have addressed in the future uh, in weeks to come there will be webcasts on attachment issues and uh, de-escalation techniques uh, to be used with children who are extremely angry thank you again for opening your hearts and homes uh, to these children because we couldn't do what we do without you and I want to say thank you on behalf of our panel to South Kitsap High School for allowing us to use their beautiful facility this evening. Thank you and join us again. Good evening. <laughs>